Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're here. Welcome to Cornerstone Presbyterian Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together, and uh, especially if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, you're our guest, and uh, we're glad that you're here. So, welcome. We have a few announcements before we begin our service of worship this morning. You can find these on the very uh, last page of, of your bulletin, and so if you would if you would join me there, just a few announcements to draw your attention to. First of all, we are going to host a virtual Exploring Cornerstone class coming up um, in the next few weeks. And so if, if either you or, or someone that you know is interested in knowing more about Cornerstone, possibly even going towards membership, this is the place to be, and um, we'd love for you to join us. And so you can email Susan at the email address that's printed there. And so Again, whether it's, uh, if it's you or someone that you know, uh, we'd love to answer any questions that you have about what the class covers and, and how we're going to host it and all that, but, um, but that's coming up, so be aware of that. Um, also, we're going to host our second of, of two uh, Thursday roundtable discussions this week at 7 o'clock. Uh, virtually, you can, you can see this uh, on our website. So at 7 o'clock, uh, Tony and Nate and I are going to... Uh, host another roundtable discussion around the work of the Holy Spirit and uh, how the Spirit is, in, is equipping us to live faithfully in this cultural moment and everything that, um, that we as Christians are, are walking through right now, how to live faithfully in it. And so we'd love for you to, to join us as we um, probably come with just as many questions as we have answers, but it's, um, I, I hope will be, will be helpful. That will be our second installment of that this week at 7 o'clock. And then lastly, on the right-hand column of this page, you can see a lot of different announcements that pertain to uh, our student ministry and our women's ministry, men's ministry, things that are coming up as, as we come back to life here at Cornerstone uh, throughout the week and not just on Sunday morning. Uh, there are ways that we can enter back into fellowship and ministry together. So please look at that and, and enter into the life of our church this week and the next coming weeks. So. Again, um, welcome, especially if you're visiting with us. Glad to have you here. Welcome to Cornerstone, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord together. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Let me also just add a word of welcome to Ben's welcome this morning. We're glad that you're here in the presence of the Lord with us as we come and worship Him on His day and seek to give praises and honor to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to extend welcome to those of you who may be uh, joining us via live stream this morning. Uh, we are delighted that you're with us this morning. We pray that as you see us worship here and as we know that you're worshiping in homes scattered across Middle Tennessee and some of you visitors in other places, uh, we hope that you rejoice in the glory of God with us and you're heartened by the fact that your brothers and sisters are here lifting up praises to the name of Christ. Now, as you see in the bulletin this morning, especially in our announcements, you'll note that we are beginning this, the slow process of reopening in-person ministries, whether youth or men's studies and other ways that we can connect as a congregation, especially in and through our home fellowship groups. Uh, we just want to continue to encourage you as a congregation to remain mindful and safe and careful with one another as you gather in the variety of ministries here at Cornerstone, but to encourage you at the same time to not miss out on opportunities that you can safely fellowship and be encouraged uh, in the faith together through the ministry of the church. We also want to just ask you to pray for us as leaders as we continue to make decisions regarding what's proper and appropriate during this day and time. As you might imagine, everyone has their own ideas as to what is appropriate and proper during this day and time. And what we're trying to do is to submit our consciences to the Lord, pay close attention to um, the best uh, information and the best practices that we can uh, gain from trustworthy resources in order to make those decisions together. And let's continue to just bear with each other and be patient in this whole process and seek by God's grace to bear each other's interests up before the Lord and continue to just be astonished at the fact that our God loves us, that he cares for us, and that he's drawing us into sweet fellowship Together, And we're going to rejoice in that even today as we worship in spirit and in truth. 
We started last week, if you're with us for the first time, we started last week into a series in the book of Psalms called Finding Your Way to God. We looked at Psalm 8 together and we considered the strength of our God and we considered the power of, of God's people in worship to advance the kingdom of God. Today we come to a wisdom psalm in Psalm 14 where we explore what true biblical wisdom looks like as opposed to what worldly foolishness gives us an example of in this psalm. And it teaches us really to cast our mind and attention towards the God who is there. I have a friend who says, in every decision that you, need, that you make, in every circumstance you find yourself going through, you have to always remember the God factor. And, and what he says in that is to take in mind that God is involved in this. He is present. He is with us. And we are to be a people who are mindful of his presence and his purposes. As we come into the presence of the Lord from a million different directions, from a myriad of different experiences, let our minds now set towards God as we bring our souls into his presence and ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten us according to his truth and give to us his grace as we seek to declare his praise both to him and to the throne room of heaven, but also to a watching world about the greatness of our God. Let's stand together and let's sing. Give thanks to God the I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness.
Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the New Testament book of Hebrews, one of our favorite books that talks about faith and a lot of the Old Testament heroes. We're going to read just the first six verses of that. Please give attention to the reading of God's holy word. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the word of God. Be to God. Please be seated. As we just read in Hebrews chapter 11, the life of faith is characterized by looking at things that are hoped for and things that are not seen. As Christians, we walk, we walk the path that Jesus invites us to walk, living our lives more oriented towards the future than we are towards the present, and more oriented towards things that we can't see than things that we can see. That is the life of faith that, um, that it means to follow Jesus. And yet so often, and it, we find it so easy and so natural to slip back into living our lives characterized by looking at things that we can see and living our lives oriented towards the present um, with hearts that are anchored in what our eyes can see and not what the eyes of our hearts see and anchored in what's going on around us, what we have access to um, immediately present to our senses and not, not at what is coming, the future that God invites us to live into and participate in. And Paul has a word for that in the New Testament. He says that that's living ashamed of the gospel, ashamed of the gospel, ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. And he, and he writes about this all over the New Testament. Living a life um, motivated by lesser desires, 
loving lesser things, believing a lesser story about ourselves and being ashamed of the gospel. And this morning we come to confess that this has been true of us this week, that we have lived our lives um, more oriented towards what we can see rather than what we can see by the eyes of our hearts by faith and more oriented towards what's going on in our present than what we know is coming in our future. And the astounding good news, brothers and sisters, is that the God that we have lived ashamed of invites us into his presence. He is that good and that merciful. And he says, come and let me restore you. Let me restore you to the truth, the truth of who you really are and who, and who I really am so that you can live in light of me. So come, let us confess our sins together. Lord, we come confessing you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. But we have not fanned into flames the gift that you have placed within us for your purposes. You have saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of your own purpose in grace, which you gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. We confess there are times that we have been ashamed of this testimony about our Lord. Your grace has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And we have been called to proclaim and teach this. But there are times in which we have kept silent of this testimony in fear of sharing in the suffering for the gospel. May we not be ashamed, for we know whom we have believed, and we are convinced that you are able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to us. Give us grace to follow and proclaim the life-giving words of the gospel in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit, Guard the good deposit you have entrusted to us. Father, we pray that you would hear our cries for mercy, hear the cries of of your children that know that we have lived uh, this week and even woken up this morning, um, not living fully into the future that is ours in Christ, but living more characterized by the worries and concerns of the present. And that we have lived our lives according to what the eyes of our, in our heads can see rather than, rather than what the eyes of our hearts can see. Oh, Lord, it is true that what we can't see is just as true and more true than what we can see. And yet, oh, Lord, so often we live in such small worlds, forgetting you and forgetting what you are doing in this world. Oh, Lord, it is true that the first line of Psalm 14 this morning is true of us, that we have lived like fools and have said in our hearts that there is no God. Lord, forgive us for our thoughts that reflect that, for our actions that have reflected that, for our worries and concerns, our motivations that reflect that. And, oh, Lord, call us Call us uh, either for the first time or for the 10,000th time to a life lived before the very face of God, remembering you and your grace and love and power and justice in all that we think and say and do. Oh, Lord, our one, our one hope is not that we can do this fully, but that you have done this fully for us. And so we, we fling ourselves by faith on our Savior and ask that you would show us grace and mercy. In your name we pray. Amen. Our assurance of pardon is from Romans chapter 1, where Paul writes, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For in it, that is in the gospel, the very righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous live by faith. The Christian life is a life shot through and through from beginning and end by faith. Where we access what is not ours by nature, but what is ours now in Christ by faith. And, and God, our Father, looks at us in Christ and says, because you are, you are united to my Son, I see you as just as righteous as he is. I am just as pleased with you right now as I am pleased in him. That is the power of the gospel, brothers and sisters, the good news that we lean into once again this morning and that causes our hearts to sing. And so let us stand and sing together. reading from God's holy word this morning comes from Psalm 14. Psalm 14, the psalm of David to the choir master. Please give attention to the reading of God's holy word. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They've all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. You may be seated. Now, before we uh, take a few minutes to look at this word together, let's pray briefly and ask for the Lord's help. Let's pray together. 
Our Father in heaven, we acknowledge right now our desperate need for you to be present with us in this word. You tell us that unless you come and illumine uh, this word to our hearts and minds, we will be uh, dim and we will be dull. We will not be able to receive this word apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, whether it be he who communicates or uh, we who hear uh, this word right now, we would ask that you would make it live. You'd make it sing and be woven into the hearts and the lives of each and every one of us. That in every way, we would honor and bless you by the teaching that we gain this day from this, your word. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I remember a time when I was a pretty young boy. I was in a Sunday school uh, class setting where my very patient uh, Sunday school teacher was entertaining my complaints about a variety of different matters, but particularly a frustration that I had with a certain individual who shall remain nameless. As I was complaining about this person in the midst of the Sunday school class under the guise of a prayer request, He said to me, well, what would be different about the way that you feel about them or speak about them or experience them if you walked for a mile in their shoes and you could see through their eyes? I was a young man. I didn't fully grasp all of what he was talking about. I knew this boy's shoes didn't fit my feet, and I knew that I couldn't walk a mile in his shoes nor see through his eyes, but I began to pick up what it was that he was putting down. He was asking me, What would be different if you knew his experiences? What he had gone through. And if you could live life for a moment through his eyes. Almost any counselor or therapist would tell you that a very important part of learning the skill of of empathy and care for another. And true knowledge of another person. Especially in the midst of division or conflict. Is to be able to see things through their eyes. To begin to experience and inhabit the world the way they experience and inhabit the world. That there might be a match of understanding, a meeting of mind and heart together. Now, you've probably not thought of it in this way, but each time that we come to worship and we sit in a passage of Scripture together, you know what you're being called into? To see through the eyes of the Lord. You're being called to know Him. To understand Him. To understand how he views the world and to take it up as your sight, as the way you view the world, as the way you would walk through the world. Because his perception is not just an angle or a take. His perception is the truth. It's the way things are. As we come to Psalm 14 this morning, I want to look at this passage all from God's take, all from God's perspective, this way of truth. But I want to situate ourselves in this text from the variety of angles I think we're given within Psalm 14. A way in which we can begin to sit in a variety of seats, walk in a variety of shoes, and see through a variety of eyes. And I want to start by looking through the eyes of the fool. You see, that's where this passage starts. It starts with looking through the eyes of a fool. How does a fool think? How does he or she walk? How do they live? What do they understand reality to be? Right there at the beginning of Psalm 14, verse 1, we get these words. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, immediately, some of you in this room go, I don't know why I need to look through the eyes of a fool. Nate, we're in church. Like, like we're the people who believe that there's a God. Obviously, this guy who's ever being referenced at the beginning of Psalm 14 doesn't apply to me. Well, I'd, I'd like to beg to differ for just a second. If you could suspend your convictions along that line to argue that there actually may be more than one type, if I could put it this way, of atheists in the world. There may be the Richard Dawkins type, the intellectually convinced and the committed profession that there is no God and a type of intelligible argument or at least some type of intelligible argument for the reason that there is no God. But when 
David is writing Psalm 14, here's the reality. There isn't a plausible country or position in the ancient Near East where there is a worldview that upheld, like our own day and time of secularism, that it was plausible to conceive of the world as if there really was no God. That's very much a modern conception. If you look at the history of intellectual atheism as a worldview, it really doesn't rise till post the Enlightenment and really come into flowering during the secular age. David is writing hundreds, maybe even thousands of years before a plausible intellectual atheism is afoot, like the kind that we deal with today. And so what is David talking about? Well, David is talking about the kind of atheism that every single one of us battles. The kind of atheism that lives life without reference to God. Very few of us here in this room would probably be able to quote, if there was a creed on the liturgy today, I believe that there is no God. We would very quickly be offended at such language and distance ourselves from such claim. But how many of us this week have thought without any reference to God? How many of us have felt and related with others without any thought of God? How many of us have made significant decisions as if God didn't exist? There is a functional and practical atheism that David is addressing within the context of this passage, a kind of atheism that every single one of us have to wake up every morning and battle to not let the things of this world and the the arguments of this world and the pressures of this world to be treated as if we live in a closed world rather than an open world. As if all of the decisions and the, and the goals and the priorities and the processes of life have to do with the way we interact with them and the circumstances and systems of the context in which we live. How many of us do live our day-to-day -day lives as if God really doesn't matter? You see, that's actually the, the point here when he says, the fool says in his heart. Notice the fool's not saying with his mouth. He's not professing this. He says it with his heart, his mind, his will, and his emotions, the way he functions. It's the very center of his being. He's one who operates without making reference to God. One of the distinctives of a Christian worldview, a way of conceiving and looking at the world, is as things unfold, we understand them, we interpret them, we speak about them, and we reflect on them with the God factor in view. When we look out at our nation and we see what's taking place and we see parties and and battles and violence and retaliation and we see policies and we see prescriptions about the way things ought to be. The Christian may have opinions and thoughts on all of those things about how they should be handled. But he or she is first and foremost and primarily looking at the story of the Bible and the revelation of God's word about the nature of men and nations. About the solution for what brings unity and harmony and peace in the world. And he's bringing the truth of the gospel, the glory of Christ to bear on every circumstance. He's not getting caught up in movements or in parties. He or she is being baptized in the truth of the perspective of God's word. What we're actually being invited to in the context of, of this passage is to ask ourselves the question, are we living as practical atheists day in and day out, do we really consider from the big decisions to the small decisions that God is intimately acquainted with it all? His purposes and goals are unfolding. He has something to say, something for us to believe, and something for us to do. We're looking through the eyes of the fool. Part of what we see when we live with this perspective, the perspective of the fool that says there is no God, is it frees us up to live as if there's no morality. You see, that's why there's a flow, a logic to Psalm 14. Immediately after the confession, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Notice where he goes. They are corrupt, speaking of the foolish. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. 
The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there's any who understand, who seek after God. But listen, they've all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There is none who do good. No, not even one. Uh, There's a few intellectual atheists that you can read today uh, who are actually, um, I think, intellectually honest on this point. And that is the fact that when we begin to profess and confess and live like there is no God, one of the attracting points to that worldview structure is that it frees us from any transcendental standard for morality. It was all just Huxley years ago, one of the well-known atheists of the last century who argued that one of the reasons that he was inclined (laughs) towards atheism as a world destructure was he realized that he could then do whatever it is that he wants. Fedor Dostoevsky and the Brothers Karamazov in that section of the great inquisitor, Ivan, who's speaking after a long period of argument, says essentially the same thing. That if there is no God in the world, then all things are permissible. All bets are off. Nobody can tell me what to do. Sound familiar? As we become increasingly unhinged from a creator God who governs all things and in whom we must give an account, we become loosed from any morality, any objective standard of living, and each is free to do what is right in his own eyes, to steal a line from Judges. Psalm 14 by theologians has been regularly used to defend the Presbyterian and Reformed doctrine of total depravity. Now, let's be honest. It's not our favorite doctrine. It's not very flattering. When we start hearing that we are fallen in every capacity, from mind to will to emotions, and that all organizations that we're involved in from businesses to nonprofits to governmental structures to churches are going to be rife with sin. They're going to be shot through with the reality of sin because there's sinners within it and there's no way for us to escape it. Some of us have thought, I just want to go to the ends of the earth. I want to break away from all the wickedness, all the wildness of this world, the corruption that's there. And the problem is, if you were to go to the ends of the earth and you were to find that little cabin in the woods, you know what you would find there? Sin, because there you are. When we talk about total depravity, what we mean is that every part of the human person and every aspect of The the human sphere and the world in which we live is tainted and touched with and actually brought down and enslaved to the reality of sin. Some of us have rejected that idea because we've heard total depravity and we've thought to ourselves, that must argue that we are as bad as we possibly could be. That's not what we're arguing with total depravity. We're not arguing comprehensive depravity. As if we're all, to the greatest extent, terrible people. The fullest extent of our wills has been given over to that which is wicked. But we are saying that every aspect of us has been touched with sin and is tied to sin and is enslaved to sin. When we begin to say there is no God, we begin to move from foolishness, a statement of foolishness, to a life of folly. We spiral, as it were, down the rabbit hole. And it takes only a little glimpse at the news to see how that happens. Or or let me me get a little closer to home. It, It only takes a little glimpse at your home. It only takes a little glimpse at your heart. This is comprehensive in that regard. That no one is able to escape the reality of sin. Now, when we see this in the psalm, David doesn't leave us there. He doesn't just want us to look through the eyes of the fool, though there's wisdom to be gained by looking through the eyes of the fool because you know what begins to happen? What I hope has been happening for you is that you begin saying, there's some fool in me. There's some fool in me. I bum through my life and I ask Uh, questions and make directions and plans and priorities that are not according to God's will or word and I hardly ever think of him. I'm like the rich fool in Luke chapter 12 who has a great harvest and decides he doesn't have barns big enough so he just breaks down the barns to fit all the grain in and God comes to him and he says, listen, you're living as if you're in control of your future. 
But tonight your soul is required of you. Friends, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We, we don't know what the Lord has in store for us. We must live today by the light of the God factor. That he is with us. That he is the reason and the light for which we live in the world. So that's the eyes of the fool. But I want to look secondly through the eyes of the Lord. Notice this in the text. It actually speaks of it in just that way in verse 2. The Lord looks down from the heavens on the children of man to see if there is any who understand or who seek after God. Now, if you can see a bit of the irony in David's writing, he's, here are, here's the fool who's looked up to the sky and says, yeah, there's no God. I can do whatever it is I want to do. And here is God looking down from the heavens. Notice the position that David has put him in. He's over man. He's in the heavens. He's above the earth. He's in a position of authority. And notice that he looks down on him as if he's small. He's humble. He, it's actually the language that's referred in the text. Notice he doesn't look down on men. He looks down on the children of men. It's a reference to smallness. It's a reference to those who should be under authority. He looks down from the heavens on the children of man and he looks. Do any of them understand? The word literally is, do any of them think or act wisely? He's comparing wise and foolishness in the passage. Do any of them understand? Do any of them seek God. Now as he, as he does that, as he's giving a description of God's power in the midst of this and the God's rule in government, he's meaning to help us look through the reality of who God is. He wants us to see through the eyes of the Lord. That the, the, the Lord is one who rules and reigns. He's, he's one who governs over all. He's much larger and bigger than we are. We are small. We are but children of men. We owe to Him. We're responsible to Him. He is our maker and we are His creatures. It's putting us, if we can put it this way, in our place. He's helping us come to the knowledge of who we are. John Calvin says that, that the true wisdom and divine and biblical wisdom that's given to us from the Lord always comes when we bring into relationship the wisdom of God and the understanding of who we are as men. That's what's happening in this passage. As soon as we begin to find our place and know who we are in relationship to God, there is hope for wisdom. But not only does this image of he looked down from the heavens teach us about you know, wisdom and strength and power of God, it actually teaches us something about, well, God's judgment. Do you see that language of looking down from the heavens is used uh, regularly in the Old Testament, many of those prominently in Genesis before the flood? In Genesis chapter 6, as God looks over the, the scope of mankind in the world, it says he looks down on them and what he sees is that every intention of the thoughts of their heart was evil continually. A little later, in Genesis chapter 11, God again is described as looking down on the people at the Tower of Babel and then coming down and confusing their languages and scattering them because their goal was to make a name for themselves. But he took account of their purposes and their intentions and their actions and he looked down. He took record of them and he acted in judgment and scattered them. Maybe most poignantly is in Genesis 18 when he looks down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And you maybe will remember how Abraham sought to intercede on the behalf of Lot and his family who are now living close to and then finally in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he comes to him and he says, listen, if there, if there are 50 righteous, if there are 40 righteous, if there are 20 righteous, if there are 10 righteous, if, and he stops because he realizes that no one does good, not even one. There was no one in Sodom and Gomorrah that could represent the righteous. Would you save the city if there was one who was righteous? And the reality is there were none who were righteous. The judgment of the Lord in each of those circumstances fell. And part of wisdom and seeing through the eyes of the Lord is not walking through life as if the things that you do will not be held in account. That's the height of foolishness. I'll do this and God will never see it. These chickens will never come home to roost. There will never 
be consequences for my words and actions. It's the height of foolishness to think that you're on your own and that you can, you can live as if you're, you're invisible to the eye of God. God is saying, look through my eyes. I see everything. I see everything. He will call every idle word to judgment, he tells us. You think I remember every word I've spoken? Heavens, no. You think he's forgotten? No. My omniscient and omnipotent God knows every word. He knows the words I've spoken loudly. He knows the words I've whispered under my breath. He knows the things that I've done publicly. He knows the things that I do privately. You see, when we begin to think about this God who looks down from heaven on the children of men, do you see what begins to happen? Humility. And then what else? Sobriety. We begin to think, these things matter. There's a reality of God's account and judgment that is coming. And we begin to order our steps according to His will. Now when we do that, we take this into account. We begin to walk according to God's eyes. He wants us to know that an attack is going to come from the outside when this happens. He actually says here that the evildoers will begin to take aim at my people. He says they will eat my people up as if they were bread. Friends, this is important for us to see through God's eyes here. We should, he says we should expect this, that when we begin to be sobered and cry out to the Lord, when we're redeemed by our God and begin to be changed through the power of the Holy Spirit, the outside world is going to come on attack. Persecution will be at your door. Rejection is to be anticipated. This is really important because so many of us are surprised when that happens. Which tells us we're not actually looking through the eyes of the Lord. Because he's been very clear about this. That you will become a living offense to those who have rejected God in his ways. You become, as it were, a reminder, even a provocation or even a fear to them. That what if you are right? We must do away with you. I don't want that in front of me. They eat up my people as they were a meal, he says. When you're looking through God's eyes, humility comes, soberness comes, but also a realistic expectation of how things are going to go between the church and the world. Uh, right now, there is a tremendous persecution that has befall Nigeria in Africa, the largest country in Africa. 350 Christians have been killed uh, by Muslims there since the beginning of 2020. Now, you probably haven't heard about it in the news. Which makes some of us mad because we're not getting the kind of airspace we should get. But should we really expect to get the kind of airspace? In the light of everything that we're talking about here, should that, should that be something we anticipate? No, probably not. But the fact that the church is beginning to experience, even in our own day and time, in the context of North America, a place where we've enjoyed a tremendous amount of freedoms, do you not feel a tenuousness between the relationship of God's people and our own state? A tenuousness between the church and the world? You think if you, if you today were, 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 were going to stand publicly and strong for the sexual ethics of the Bible in the public square, how well would that go for you today? Probably not very well. When you begin to stand for the things which are identifying markers of what it means to be a believer in the world, God says, look through my eyes they rejected my Savior and killed him. How will they not do the same to his people? Do not be surprised by fiery trial. It is what we, as we look through the eyes of the Lord, should anticipate. But now here, as we look through the eyes of the Lord, we recognize the eyes of the foolish and the actions that lead to folly in the world. And even manifested in our own context in our own lives as we live as practical atheists. God says, I want you to look through the eyes of hope. I want you to look through the eyes of hope, which we might say is just one shade of looking through the eyes of the Lord. Because what he says in this passage is that I will remember you. I will be with you. Notice verse 5. For they are in great terror. The they in that verse is actually the evildoers. 
They are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. Oh, look at the change that we've seen in the text. Look at the movement in the psalm. God is not described here as being on high, as judge over. Though that's certainly true of who he is. He's described as alongside. He's described as with. He's with the generation of his people, meaning he stands with them in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their persecution. He's right there beside them. He upholds them. He gives them strength. He establishes them. In fact, he uses them as a means by which to bear witness for him to a watching world. Isn't it interesting that he doesn't say, when you look through my eyes and you see what it is that I'm going to do, you'll always be saved from suffering and persecution. He doesn't say that, does not he? But he does say what? He'll be with us in the midst of it. He'll be with us in the midst of it. Maybe you're asking the question this morning, well, why doesn't he rescue us out of it? I'd like that, right? I'd like for him to rescue us out of it. We'll think about it. If he always just rescued you out of the suffering and the challenge and the persecution that you face by standing up for Christ in the, in the world, would you ever grow into the likeness of a Savior who was rejected and attacked and spurned and loved anyway? Who cared for his enemies? And gave his life for those who would spitefully use him? Would you grow into the likeness of a Savior if you didn't have a similar path as the Savior? The one that he's called you to follow? Is it not clear that he has said in the word, take up your cross daily and follow me? This is the experience of of being a Christian. There's pain, there's suffering that's a part of it. But there's there's a Christ-likeness that comes in the midst of it. And actually... He's teaching us even more than that. He's teaching us not to look to God merely to rescue us from circumstances. But to instead look to God in the midst of the circumstances. Until the God is more important to you than the change of your circumstances. Do You see, that's what he says in the passage. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. The Lord is his refuge. He becomes our safe place. Not that we're in a safe neighborhood or in a safe country or that there's a risk, but that he has become our safety. How is it that that he becomes our, our safety? Well, he notes this. For I'll owe that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people let, the, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. How does it become a safe place for us? Well, there's lots of appropriate answers. I just want to give a, a couple as we close our time together today. When he says that God is our refuge in the, in the midst of our plans being shamed, in the, in the midst of being eaten up, By by persecution? He means to say there is something that our plans, though thwarted, and our persecution, though creating pain, can't take away from us if we've got God with us. He's saying what Paul will say in Romans, that, that neither death nor life, nor angels or principalities, nor wars nor suffering nor anything in this life can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. When we know that that is true, we can come to God in the midst of the storm and not merely say, I'll trust you if you take away the storm. But to say, as the storm rages on, I have found a calm in the midst of it. I have been found in you. You are the constant reference point of the peace of which I abide in. You are that I, as it were, in the midst of the hurricane of life. You you are that place of which I can be in the midst of a world falling apart. And I can rest in knowing that I am held by you. When Paul speaks of us being found in Christ, when he speaks of us being in union with Christ, 
that all of our identity is located in Christ, he means to say that Jesus is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in times of trouble, that no one can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And look at the confidence here. Look at the hope. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, not if... Not if, but when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Do you see, you should feel the tension of this. We have incredible confidence right now as we gather here in Middle Tennessee in this wild year of 2020. We have incredible confidence in the Lord because we have in our past a salvation that has come from Zion. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already come. And he divested himself of all of his fortunes. In order to give you all of his fortunes. When he went to the cross on your behalf. You have that as a reality of which we presently live in. When he resurrected from the grave it told you that he defeated it. Your final and last enemy. And that you now live in a world where resurrection is afoot. And all of the inheritance of Christ is laid at your disposal. That's the wind blowing at your back. Salvation has come out of Zion. But then notice what he says secondly. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Have all of the fortunes of God's people been restored? Well, yes and no. Yes in Christ, but have we seen the glory and the consummation of Christ's fortunes being completely restored in a new heavens and a new earth? No, we haven't seen that yet. But the psalmist is saying, when that happens... Let us be glad. Notice his confidence. Notice his hope. Looking through the eyes of the Lord. Looking through the promises of hope. He doesn't say if. He doesn't shake in his boots in the midst of the storm. He's already rejoicing in the midst of the storm by the end of the psalm. And he's taken a journey. And he has found himself seated strongly on the ever certain and sure hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what faith is? Faith and hope as they relate with one another is a laying hold of the unseen things. And by laying hold of them in the present, they become a reality to you now. They become a reality to you now. He's already saying that. When the fortunes come, he's just looking. He already has them. He's got them, he's got them already invested in his heart. And he's waiting for the day when what he already has possesses in Christ in his heart is a reality from top to bottom all over the heavens and all over the earth. Friends, when we have that kind of hope and we look through those kinds of the eyes of hope, we will quit mealy-mouthing all of the time about woe is us in the world because the reality is I'm looking at the richest people in heaven and earth right now because God himself has shed his blood for you. And he has purchased you. And he has laid his own life on the line and his own commitments and promises on the line to ensure that you are his and he is yours. And there is no greater cost that could be given for that end and for that purpose. Let the fortunes of Jacob be restored. They are restored. Let the people be glad and rejoice. No matter what happens, my friends. Cast your gaze through the eyes of the Lord, under the eyes of hope. Reject the vision of the fool. Let us live our lives with utter and complete reference to God. And let's trust Him to take care of all the rest. Let's pray to that end right now. Lord in heaven, come and meet us in this. Come and meet us in this this hope. This hope for a future when Jacob's fortunes will be full and complete. This hope for a future where all of Israel will be glad. Lord, we rejoice in it now. We lay hold of it now by faith. And we anticipate the day in your return when we will be right there with you. And all of the struggles of sin, all of the upheaval of life in this world will be no more. But it won't be our circumstances that will be our primary focus. 
It will be you who will occupy our eyes and our hearts. For heaven is heaven. Not because of streets of gold and gates of pearls. Heaven is heaven because you are there. Because you are there. Capture us with a vision of who you are until you become the greatest treasure of all of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together. be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Children of the living God, let us profess our faith together with Christians throughout the ages using the Apostles' Creed. What is it that you believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Take and eat. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup also. And he said, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. We said a moment ago that if we're looking through the eyes of the Lord, we should anticipate opposition. We should anticipate uh, persecution. We don't bear up under that opposition or that persecution with a stiff upper lip or some uh, training in emotional and mental stamina, as important as those things may be. We bear up under those persecutions and oppositions by looking to the one who was opposed and persecuted. The one who was opposed and persecuted on our behalf. The one who we opposed and persecuted. Who our sin led him to the cross 
through our rejection over and over and over in thought and word and deed throughout the course of our lives. How many of us this week, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus, and then we've said and spoken and acted in ways that look totally contrary. You see, the problems, my friends, aren't out there. The problems are in here. We have said in our heart, there is no God. But our God has said in his heart, I will love you and make you my own. He didn't leave us in our rebellion. He didn't leave us in our rejection. But he put grace on the chase, as it is said. And he ran after us with his love. And even today, he calls us into remembrance that he who was persecuted and opposed for us still clings to us with his love. He's never going to change his mind. And today he's the host of this table. Not me, not this church. He is the host of this table. And if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, committed to him, baptized and in good standing with his church, he says to you, come to this table and feed on me by faith. See my love and know it and be changed. Let today be a renewal of your own commitment to God in Christ as you hear his ongoing and renewing commitment to you. Let's pray to that end right now. Father in heaven, we just simply ask you to use this means of grace, the Lord's Supper, as a way for us right now to meet with you. That you would set apart this ordinary bread and this ordinary wine for a holy use. That you would strengthen the believers in faith. That they might be able to receive opposition and persecution. That together we might forsake folliness and foolishness. And that we might look with hope to a future that even now is breaking into our hearts by faith. And look to the day when all of the fortunes are completely restored. And the gladness we know right now will be a gladness of a heavenly kind. And a gladness that will never end. Lord, meet us now, right now in this table. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. As our ushers lead us to the Lord's table this morning, let's feed on our Lord by faith. Let's come to his table.
Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, with, with, this, uh, with this taste on our lips, having just tasted a preview, a sample uh, of the feast that is to come, we pray that you would send us out into the world that you call us into. Um, oh Lord, longing for the feast knowing that we will feast in the house of Zion and that we will sing with our hearts restored. Oh God, we are so forgetful. Lord, five or ten minutes after we walk out of this, out of this building, we will be pressed with other things that are vying for our heart's attention and love and, and memory and focus. Oh God, keep us aware of, the, of what is truly true, that the future that you have secured for us is real and is coming and is on the other side of the veil. It's, it's right there. Oh God, help us not to live as fools who would say that there is no future like that coming, but to live as those who are anchored, oh Lord, in the reality that you have bought for us by your blood. Because, oh Lord, we we go from this place into a world that is broken and hurting, and, and we can hear its groanings in our, in our bodies and in our communities, in our homes, in our vocations, in our relationships. We can, we can feel it deep down in our hearts that this world is not how it was made to be, and it will not always be this way. And so, oh God, as you send us, as you call us, back out into that groaning and hurting world where we feel it even in ourselves. Oh God, 
Equip us by your Spirit. Be the wind in our sails to know that, that you are our God. To remember not only that there is a God, but that the God who is is the God who is our Father. That the God who is is the God who has come down into the brokenness and the groaning and the muck and the mire of our world and our experience to surrender your own interest, to become a servant and to die to save your enemies. Oh, Lord, let us live in light of that and so be agents of your peace and healing in this world. But, oh, Lord, even as you call us to do that, we feel our own weakness, our own feebleness and our frailty. Lord, we know that we are so completely powerless on our own to effect any kind of change in this world and to bring your kingdom to bear against the gates of hell in this world. And so, O Holy Spirit, in our weakness, we lean into you to find strength. And we pray that in our weakness, we would, that we would know your strength, that you would push back against the gates of hell and darkness in this world and in our own communities and and homes and, and city and state and country Oh, Lord, through the weakness of those that trust and believe in you, through the weakness of a gospel that is proclaimed, of of a Messiah that is going to make all things new through his death and resurrection and his second coming. Oh, Lord, let us go from this place, seeing that with the eyes of our hearts and so anchored in that. There are so many other things that are on our hearts, O oh Lord, that are welling up within us um, that, you, that you alone can see. You interpret our groanings and you intercede um, for us on our behalf. And so, Lord, in the confidence that you know our cares and our concerns, uh, we pray this prayer that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, both now and forever. Amen. Yeah. 